All right. So we are talking about osteology still. Let's keep on going with that. So we have an articular process, a superior. We, we cover this in lab. Superior articular process here. And an inferior articular process. I can draw this. Superior articular process is here. Basically to right about there. And we have an inferior articular process goes down like that. We can also see the facet put in pink. Facet would be right there. Now we can't see the facet of the inferior articular process. All right. Now the you guys know that already, but it's important to know which direction these facets face. Those are always kind of softball board questions. <clears throat> so basically the facets face posteriorly on the superior articular uh, facets. So the facets of the superior articular process face superiorly and the facets of the inferior articular process, which you can't really see that good, they're on the other side, but they face more anteriorly. So make sure you know that because <coughs> that will be on my test too. Alright, facets of the inferior articular process face almost completely anteriorly. And there's not unusual for them to be a little asymmetric. One may be a little more lateral facing and one may be more straight anterior facing. Here is a, bless you, the boss is getting ready for work. Um, here's an inferior IDS view of a typical thoracic vertebrae and you can now we can see the inferior articular facets of the inferior articular process uh, kind of situated. The lamina is pretty skinny too. Where some of you might say, where's the lamina, I wonder? So the lamina would be right about between here and here. So that little, that little stretch is the lamina. It's much more narrow. <coughs> Anybody see anything wrong with this? The owner of this bone? How's that, how's that vertebra foramen look? That's too short, isn't it? That's too small. So this patient had congenital stenosis, and they probably had trouble walking and, and such. All right. Uh, <clears throat> so because of this orientation, this kind of front and back orientation, there's a lot of rotation that can occur on these facet joints. In other words, you can lateral, lateral bending. You can bend to the right and bend to the left. Or side bending is another word for that. We'll look at the real word, the biomechanical word for that later. But <clears throat> there's not a lot of flexion and extension that can go on in the thoracic spine because of that and because of the ribs. It's also not believed to be a source of pain. You're not going to treat too many people with chronic thoracic spine pain. That is the real pain generator. People with disc herniations in the cervical spine, you can get referred pain into the thoracic spine, and into the rhomboid region, and into the trap region. But it's not really a problem. It's just they think there's a problem there. <clears throat> so in and of itself, it's even with disc herniations, you don't see many thoracic disc herniations. Probably maybe a couple dozen I've seen over my, since I've been doing my consulting business since 2002. I've seen maybe a handful. <clears throat> Um, how come? Why Why is that? Well, first of all, the ribs protect the disc. It's almost like a natural fusion. Uh, the discs don't have a lot of pressure on them because the ribs take a lot of the axial load. And there's also fewer nociceptors. Remember what those are? Those, those, those little pain sensors. There's fewer of those that are found in the Z joints compared to cervical and lumbar, which is kind of weird. So the medial branch still supplies these Z joints these facet joints, um, but there's the density of nociceptors is not as great. Um, also, the synovial folds, uh, which which line the joint, um, this, they're thinner, and they're not they don't poke out of the joint as much. <clears throat> Therefore, you can't entrap it. Same with the facet joint capsule; it's tighter. It's not loose kind of flapping in the wind like in the cervical and lumbar spine where you can pinch that 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 
fold can get sucked into the facet. And they'll talk about that more. Dr. Lou will talk about that more. And others will talk about that because that's a major cause of, um, of temporary pain. It's usually not a chronic problem. All right. A vertebral foramen. And even naturally speaking, the vertebral foramen is smaller than what we've seen. The cervicals are huge. Wait till we get up there, but it's just kind of naturally smaller. It's also more round in shape. Spinous process we've talked about. They project more, more vertically, especially T5 through T8. They're almost not quite straight vertical, but they're they're getting there. One through four though project more horizontally, like the cervical and lumbar do. Stick straight out. But they get more progressively vertical as you go from T1 through T4. And they pro get progressively more horizontal as you go from T9 to T12. Can you pick out T5 through T8? Well, those are the <clears throat> those are the ones with the really vertical spinous processes. So we just look for some vertical spinous processes. That one's crazy vertical. So is that. So that's probably five, six, seven, eight. And then nine is, that's probably nine right there. So these guys right here, I would say, it's probably five through nine. The only way to tell for sure is to count. You have to have a full spine x-ray, but <clears throat> that's a pretty close guess. And yep, looks like I guessed right. Because that was counting down from the top. What about the intervertebral foramens or the or foramen or the neural foramen, aka? Um, they face laterally. Um, the the cervical intervertebral foramen. Those are the holes which allow the nerves to leave the spine. The IVFs we can just call them for short. Um, cervicals face forward, kind of obliquely forward at about a 45 degree angle, which is weird. Um, which is actually cool because you can take X-rays because of that obliqueness, you can take oblique x-rays and look into a, an individual foramen. Whereas in the lumbar and the thoracic spine, because they're lateral, uh, you can't, we don't have a way to take a picture of them. And if you take a lateral view, you can see them nicely, but they're, the right and the left are superimposed upon one another. Um, so, yep. The other really weird thing about the foramen we talked about in the lumbar spine, the the borders of the neural foramen. Um, the one thing weird now is the ribs uh, of T1 through T10 actually are associated. They're one of the borders uh, of the intervertebral foramen, so that's kind of strange. And the 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 vertebr the the foramen and the thoracic spine, uh, they're pretty good size. But the spinal nerves are really small, and don't know why that is. The spinal nerves are much bigger in the cervical and lumbar spine. They're tiny little things, um, and therefore, um, did I not put a ratio? I thought I put a ratio in here. Um, maybe that'll come later. But they're really small, the nerve compared to the uh, the holes. Therefore, it's unusual for people to get a bone spur and stab the exiting nerve root from the neural foramen because there's so much wiggle room there. What are the borders of the intervertebral frame? This is always a good question. Well, the usual borders. So we have the vertebral body in the front. The intervertebral disc is a border. Uh, pedicles, those superior and inferior vertebral notches, which are part of the pedicle, so pedicles. Um, and then to the post here, the articular pillar, both the superior and inferior articular processes. But the rib head is also a border, and that's that's new. It's a new border. All right, here's a patient I had a couple of years. Actually, I had this as this year's patient. He had a failed fusion, um, but you can see uh, a pie. He had a, a, a really dicey, this really dangerous area, T12 and L1. The conus medullaris is right there. That's a really dicey area. have to be careful. Uh, but we can see T11 and T10 here, and the, the intervertebral foramen are really uh, quite large. And remember, on this CT scan, this is not a superimposition. This is a slice, so we are seeing it. That's probably the right neural frame in there. An x-ray, everything is smashed flat, so you can't get a single cut. There's no cuts on x-ray. 
It's like one big smashed cut. <clears throat> yep, huge neural frame. Oh, here's the little statistics thing. So the spinal nerve only occupies about 8% of the volume of the IVF. In the cervical, it's a 50% volume. That's why bone spurs or these uncinate process spurs uh, or superior articular process spurs, um, they don't have to be very big to poke the nerve and cause pain down the arm. Uh, whereas you can have a big bone spur in the IVF of the thoracic spine. And, uh, because there's so much wiggle room, it just pushes the, the nerve has plenty of room to run away from the bone spur. Uh, the ratio is 33% lumbar spine. <clears throat> That's why radiculopathy is quite rare. It happens, but it's quite rare. Uh, fun facts, it's the longest region of the spine. Uh, because of its attachment to the ribs, the motion, uh, there's very little independent motion, the motion segment uh, movement. Uh, the most movement is side flexion or side bending because of those ribs kind of tying everything down. Uh, and the size of the vertebrae increase as you go sur superior to inferior. So that's that makes sense. Posterior lateral edges of the upper thoracic vertebrae, they do have remnants of these little Batman ears we talked about yesterday. Uh, they're very small. Don't really call them uncinate processes there, but they do have some remnants of those. Another fun fact, you can always tell a vertebrae, although it's hard to see, uh, but we have the abdominal aorta, which is super important. You're going to learn all the parts of this and the different types of dissecting aneurysms, the DeBakey 1, DeBakey 2, DeBakey 3, Stanford A, Stanford B. You're going to learn the types of aneurysms that are uh, very, very dangerous here. Uh, but this is a pulsatile uh, artery, right? Because you have systole, if you've taken physiology, you know, ventricular systole sh sends a huge blast of blood out of this uh, aorta and some of it's dissipated because the, the aorta stretches to absorb some of that blood in young people like you um, but there's a big pulse of blood that goes down and that this thing pulsates and over time it actually wears away uh, the left side of the vertebral artery so it's more concave on the left because of that pulsation when compared to the right, so it's pretty easy to tell. Lower thoracic vertebrae have more lumbar characteristics. <coughs> the upper have more cervical characteristics. Uh, at the extreme ends, T12 is kind of difficult to tell apart from L1. And we'll look at the differences next week. Um, and C7 and T1 are very similar, except that's really easy. I think I showed some of you in lab uh, the difference. Remember, C7 has a, a transverse foramen. It's got a hole in a transverse process where the vertebral vein goes through, not the artery. The artery goes through, starts at 6, which is weird. Um, but T1 doesn't have that. And let's see what else. Costal facets. It has stubby little transverse processes. We'll look at that when we get to We'll look at T12 when the time comes. Uh, lateral, osteophyte, uh, lateral osteophytes are more common on the right side <coughs> of the thoracic spine, of the thoracic vertebrae, because of that pulsation discourages them from forming. Osteophytes are just like little cement pieces of bone that grow. An attempt to stabilize a segment that's gotten a little bit loose somehow. And the pulsation discourages them, so you won't see them uh, where the, the thoracic gate order is. And we talked about spondylolisthesis and spondylolysis. Very rare in the thoracic spine because of the ribs stabilizing everything. <coughs> sternum and ribs. Let's meet the sternum. We talked about it in lab. Sorry, my voice is going. <coughs> Darn these allergies. Let me get some water here. Which will probably make it worse. All right, let's meet the sternum. Here's a great picture of it. Remember we said yesterday it has really three parts. The, the manubrium is the shield. We met that yesterday. 
the body we saw is the main part. And what we didn't see is this little xiphoid process here, but you got to be really careful, right? If any of you, any of those, any of you who have had CPR know you have to be careful. You can break that off in older people. It, what is it? Forty years old, it fuses and it ossifies. We'll get to that. Um, but yeah, it's still part of the axial skeleton. <coughs> and what does it do? It's an anchor point for the anterior ribs. Um, it also protects the heart. Um, and yeah, those are the three pieces of it. We said the manubrium has a jugular notch up here at the top. I hope you can see my pointer. And who knows if this will come out on the recording or not. Uh, the clavicular notch, there's two clavicular notches right here, which contain a facet joint. Uh, so that's the facet of the clavicular notch. Uh, that's where the sternal head of the clavicle connects to. Uh, right below that, there is another notch and a, a facet for the attachment of the first rib. First rib has a full facet right here. It doesn't share. Uh, rib number two has demi facet, so there's a demi facet or a half facet here on the inferior portion of the manubrium. And there's a half demi facet on the superiormost portion of the vertebral body uh, for a connection of the second rib. It's kind of the same setup as, as the vertebral uh, on the back side, the costal facets on the back, the costal demi facets. Um, we also said that where the body meets the manubrium right here. Sometimes this is raised up and you can feel this about a piece sign down. If you put one finger in the jugular notch uh, and then feel for this. Uh, you can feel a ridge right here. That's called the sternal angle of Louis or the sternal angle. Um, this is also a joint. Um, so uh, it's the joint between the manubrium and the body. So it's called the manubrial sternal joint. So the sternal angle of Louis is formed by the manubrial sternal joint. Kind of got off my slides there, but I think I got everything covered. Um, yep, we said this already. Manubrium connects to the body. Um, it forms the manubrial sternal joint. And, you know, boards really like this. And <clears throat> we get a report on how you guys do on boards. You guys did terrible on on joint on the types of these joints. This is just like the pubic symphysis here, the symphys pubis, whichever we want to call it. It really doesn't have much movement and that's the tightest type of joint. And so this is a symphysis joint. It's got a little bounce to it, little movement, but for most purposes it doesn't move. So the manubrial sternal joint, you can believe that'll be on my test, uh, is a symphysis type joint. Okay, occasionally there are, there's are always anomalies, right? Always some weirdness in humans. Sometimes it's a diarthroidal joint in certain people, and it, you can adjust it. There's an adjustment for it. Uh, but most people, you can't, there's really no reason in adjusting it uh, because it's a, uh, it's a symphysis joint. And some people might, the professor might argue with me in that, but I don't think you can do much to that. Okay. Uh, sternal angle we talked about. We talked about the second rib. So remember the second rib is connected. There's the question, the easy question. The second rib is connected to both the manubrium and the body. The first rib has its own facet uh, for uh, on the manubrium. It doesn't share. The third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth have their own facet on the body. They don't share. But the seventh shares, there's a demi facet down here at the inferior part of the body, and a little baby demi facet on the xiphoid process, and that's where uh, rib seven, as well as the costal cartilage comes in here, which we'll look at here in a second. There's some really, this back to the sternal angle of Louis, if we took a stick and we stuck it right through here, and it's going, the stick's going into the plane of the page now. Um, that's a really important dividing line, and it's another board thing that boards love to ask. Uh, the plane passing through 
uh, a sagittal or a horizontal or transverse. Got to remember those AKAs for that type of plane, right? Uh, uh, we'll, we'll use horizontal. A horizontal plane passing through the sternal angle of Louis or through the manubrial sternal joint s separates uh, what s structures? Uh, well, it separates the superior from the inferior mediastinum. Um, it also passes through the hilum of the lung, or the hyla of the lungs, which you'll study next quarter. That's the spot where all the blood vessels and the big pipes go into the lungs at the hylas. It's also, also the place where the trachea splits uh, into the right and the left main stem or primary bronchi. Um, it also p goes right through the T4 disc. And it's also the place where the second rib is. Um, so this is good stuff to put on a note card because you'll get this on part one and probably part two of the boards as well. They like stuff like that. <coughs> uh, the body uh, is, if you look closely, it's very much like the sacrum. So we have some transverse ridges here running through the body. Um, and in in vivo, there weren't really discs here, but these were separate. It looked more like a joint here, and they fused uh, during development. And so therefore, we actually have some segments that are formed, uh, and Kramer calls these things sternebrae. Sternebrae. <coughs> Not vertebrae, but sternebrae. Right? And it's got transverse ridges in the whole nine yards. And we talked about the demi facets at the top and demi facet at the bottom. We should know that. This is for rib seven. This is for rib two. It shares the connection there. Uh, the xiphoid we've talked about, it's also a symphysis type joint for about half of your life. Let's say you live to 80. But by the age of 40, it turns to bone. And so it's no longer a symphysis joint. It's it's fused. It's part of the body. And so if you do CPR and you slip off too low, you can snap that thing right off and you're going to get sued. Uh, for sure on that. Um, yep, we said there's a demi facet. And the very last facet on the side is demi. Connects to rib 7. All right, let's meet the ribs. We're pretty good with the ribs. Um, another boards just love, look at all the stars. Bar boards love this stuff. Who's the f who are who are the true ribs? Who are the floating ribs? Who are the false ribs? What does that mean? So let's go through that again. So ribs one through seven, lucky seven, one through seven have direct connection to the sternum. Well, it's not really a direct connection, is it? We learned there's a costal cartilage that they connect to, and it's kind of like an extension, a cartilaginous extension of the rib. Um, but nevertheless, you could see the question either way they directly connect or they can or their costal cartilage directly connects the bottom line is rib one through seven connects directly to the sternum the upper one through seven ribs therefore are called the true li the ribs so lucky seven one through seven are the true ribs and the false ribs are eight nine ten eleven and twelve those are false ribs the ribs this is drake this is from students anatomy Kramer matches this too, so this is this is what you go with. Because uh, eleven through twelve are also false ribs, but they also are a different have a different cate category they go into. Um, they're called floating ribs because why? Because they don't connect to any cartilage for uh, in the front. Uh, they're floating. They have no connection with the sternum directly or indirectly. They're floating. In fact, T12 oftentimes isn't even present. All right, so we take a look at there's rib one through seven, the lucky seven. Uh, and you can see, yeah, there's seven ribs connected here. The seventh rib is a little bit weird uh, because rib number eight, nine, and ten, they have costal cartilage as well. Uh, but it, it doesn't really directly connect to the the manubrium here, or to the ster to the sternum. Instead, there's an important. Let me draw this. This is really, really important here. And when you get in fifth quarter, we we'll talk about this all the time. This is the costal margin. Make a note card of that. It's the inferior most part of the rib cage uh, on the front side. That's the costal margin. 
and it's formed by the costal cartilage of rib number 10, number 9, number 8, and rib number 7. They all contribute to this important costal margin. Why do we care about this? Well, this is the separation point between the thorax and the abdomen. When you do an abdominal exam, you have to know where this is, so you examine the abdomen, not the thorax. I had fifth quarter student just completely mess that up. Like, what the heck are you doing? He was he was trying to do a palpation up here. I'm like, can't you feel those ribs? Are you in the abdomen? <clears throat> no, the abdomen is below the costal margin, right? So that's an important structure. So I don't want to see any of you make that mistake in fifth quarter. All right, and I got off my slides again. Um, <clears throat> yep, so lucky ribs 1 through 7 attach uh, to the sternum themselves. Therefore, they're true ribs. Okay, uh, the uh, formed by the costal margin I just talked about. It's formed by the costal cartilage of ribs 7, 8, 9, and 10. It separates the abdominal from the thoracic cavity. Very, very important. There it is again. Great. Right here is a skeleton. <coughs> I'm not sure where this picture came from. This is common on x-ray. A little side note. What's that thing? Wow, look at the bone has grown. It, ribs can be very anomalous, especially as costal cartilage, and sometimes you get kind of these webs or these interconnections between the costal cartilage. Costal cartilage also likes to turn to bone as well. It's not uncommon to see this, have kind of spots of bone through this. You can see on your x-ray. Uh, but this is the rib cage. Uh, we can see the sternum here and the manubrium, and we can see the the ribs morphing into costal cartilage here. Um, you guys don't know this yet, but this this is an emphysema type patient uh, because the ribs should be angled more. They should the ribs should be going should be angled more down like this. Uh, and so I can tell the chest is really expanded in this person. So they had emphysema, which gives you what's called a barrel chest. So this is a barrel chested skeleton here. Um, anyway, you can see the floating ribs. There's rib 12 right down there, the bottom one. There's rib 11. What do they connect to? They don't connect to anything, do they? Look. There's no calls to cartilage. These are just kind of hanging in the wind. That's why they're called uh, false ribs. In general, you could say the rib cage protects the heart and the lungs or protects the thorax. The diaphragm would be would be bordering this. You'll learn about that next quarter. You'll see that next quarter. Uh, the rib cage connects posteriorly to the spine and anteriorly to the sternum. Most of the rib, well, the rib cage. This is not well. It's, it's kind of part of the rib cage still, but T eleven and twelve don't connect to anything. Um, technically. Uh, again, they don't connect to the sternum. We've already talked about the costal cartilage. It's really the costal cartilage that connects to the sternum. Typical ribs. Um, so this is different than true ribs. Remember, true ribs is lucky 7, 1 through 3. But typical ribs are ribs 3 through 9. Um, so uh, they always have the following. We've talked about the head. Yesterday we talked about it for some of you. The head, the neck, and the tubercle. Uh, that's where the anterior end uh, goes, or the anterior, I'm oh, sorry, that's where the posterior end has a head, neck, and tubercle. The anterior uh, is a flat, kind of a flat blade. Right, you can see right there, it's kind of flat looking. <coughs> so that's important to know. The posterior part of the rib is what articulates with the spine. Easy softball question. And, um, yep, you can see a spine from the back. Uh, and you can see the tubercle. Here's the tubercle of the rib. That big bump that's inferior. How that connects to the transverse process. That's a costal transverse joint. And then the other, the head of the rib connects to the vertebral body, which we can't see very good. That's called a costal corporal joint, which we've got slides coming up on that. 
Okay, rib three basic parts. It contains a, a, a head, a neck, and a tubercle. Really four basic parts and a shaft. I'm going to change that to four. I'll try to remember. To, I say that every chord and I forget. Head, neck, tubercle, and shaft. Let's just look at a picture. Do I have a picture? There we go. Let's look at this. So here's the basic parts. We have a get my drawer out here. Oh, that's fine. Let me take some water here. My wife has to make her little drink, so we're gonna get a little little noise action here. Well, I guess not yet. <laughs> so, I don't know if you can still, you can probably still hear me. Um, well, we can look at the, while she's doing that, you could say that this is the anterior part of the rib. It's not really, this rib is in the anatomical position. So it's really not anterior, but that is, it's more anterior lateral, but that is considered the anterior part of the lung, the rib. The lateral part of the rib is just the lateral part of the rib. Uh, posterior lateral would be back here. The angle is the median of the posterior lateral and posterior part of the rib. <coughs> but now we can see the parts. Uh, so the shaft we said was all of this. Shaft, 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 shaft. Shaft. Once it comes to the tubercle, that's the end of the shaft. Uh, there's the tubercle. Kind of a funky looking drawing. Uh, the neck is usually more slender. Uh, and then this is the head there. Oh god, I just I skipped right over it, so I drew it right here for you. Um, so there's a, see how the neck is much more slender here. The tubercle, remember that's always in the inferior part of the rib. There's the tubercle. There's the shaft. The angle is within the shaft. It's the posterior part of the shaft. There's the anterior part. It's more flat. Okay, great. All right, I think that's we covered the rest of that in lab. Remember I said in lab that you have to watch those angles uh, when you have fall type injuries where the, where the rib cage gets crushed, especially in an A to P manner. Let's say you get run over by a car or something. Look at the, the angles are right here. Let me draw them. Here's the angles. And now look at the other side. This is a 3D CT scan. Can you see all the fractures? Fracture here, fracture here, fracture here, displaced fracture here, another displaced fracture. See how that takes most of the stress? So high risk area for fracture. <coughs> uh, the rib head uh, is found at the posterior end again. Remember it connects, most of them connect to two adjacent vertebrae. This is a really important concept. Uh, we talked about this yesterday again. Um, but the rib will connect to the demi facets of a motion segment. And which rib matches this? Like which rib is this? If this is T6, what rib is this? Uh, well, superior, the superior demi facet, costal demi facet, names the rib. Uh, so this is T6 property. Uh, so this is the rib, this is rib number six. Rib number six here. Uh, the costal, or the transverse costal facet can also name the rib. All right, because this is, this is the T6 transverse process. So the only non-member here is... Uh, the now be careful with this. The superior facet of the rib head connects to the inferior facet, the inferior costal demi facet of the bone above. Okay, so T the the rib number six is connected to six and five. So make sure you understand that. There will be a lot of questions coming. Those are board high yield board questions. You got to know those things. Okay, <clears throat> and then that's everything I just said. Remember, it's separated by a crest as well. There's a superior and articular facet on the rib head. You could call it the facet, the superior facet of the rib head, and the inferior facet of the 
rib head. They're separated by a bony crest. Well, that crest actually does something. Uh, there's a ligament that called the interarticular ligament that runs between that crest and it attaches right to the side of the disc. Uh, so that's a rare example of a ligament actually attaching to the disc. Okay. Right, and here's just a which way is superior and which or which way is up and which way is down. So this is down, right? This is inferior. How do I know? Well, the the facet here on the rib tubercle is always down and plus I can see the costal groove right here starting right so this is the this is the rib head so this is the superior facet of the rib head and this is the inferior facet of the rib head and that's the crest that has a ligament attaching right to the lateral part of the disc see how that works see how confusing that can be All right, and again, we can say the superior facet of the rib head connects to the inferior costal demi facet of the bone above. See, that can get kind of confusing, can't you? So you need to study that and put that on note cards. Okay, the neck of the rib is this slender part right here. Who cares about that? Well, that's where those confusing ligaments that we talked about in lab the superior costal transverse ligament and just the costal transverse ligament both attached to the neck. Uh, so that's what one of the things it does. Here's a picture we didn't I didn't show you uh, in lab. Um, so here is the superior costal transverse ligament. Have a good day. Um, and behind that would run this one. They, it's cut here but that's the costal transverse ligament. Remember, that's the one I wish they would have named this the anterior costal transverse ligament and this one the posterior costal transverse ligament. But they didn't. Um, the radiate ligament is removed in this one. Here's the radiate ligament we looked at yesterday. And if you cut that away, now we can see that interarticular ligament uh, that comes off the crest of the rib and goes right into the side of the disc. Right? Here's an overhead view and you can see the costal transverse ligament nicely from this the view this one what was the name of this one this lateral one well lateral lateral costal transverse ligament okay just a blow up there great so now working our way back now we have the rib tubercle it does have an articular facet on it which we saw in lab um, what does that thing do? That's important because that's what hooks up with the uh, facet on the transverse process. The transverse costal facet meets the articular facet of the rib tubercle to form uh, that costal transverse joint. Right? Not terribly exciting stuff, is it? Uh, but you got to know this. This is on boards. Plus, you're going to be adjusting these joints. These joints always get students always kind of blow these off, but um, they are high yield board stuff. You got to know these things. Okay, what else? There's also a non-articular part. Sometimes it's called the tubercle of the tubercle of the rib, <coughs> which is confusing. Um, but that that little non non facet region of the rib tubercle, that little roughening, um, that's where the lateral costal transverse ligament connects. Okay, so there's that. Um, some people call it the tubercle of the rib tubercle, but that's the attachment point for the lateral costal transverse ligament. And there's the facet. This is all rib tubercle, and this is drawing is off a little too, isn't it? So the tubercle would run from here right up to about here. That's all tubercle. Now on the tubercle, there's a articular facet or a facet of the rib tubercle. What does that connect to? That's the transverse, connects to the, tra the transverse costal facet on the TP. Of which bone? Same bone or level above or level below? Same bone, same property. Okay. And there's the tubercle of the rib tubercle. Um, what about the shaft of the rib? 
that begins immediately uh, immediately kind of lateral uh, to the rib tubercle. And we said that goes for the rest of the rib. All right. The concept of the angle, we looked at that yesterday in lab. It's that area right there. I don't think I need to say much more about that. Um, from a PA perspective, ribs have that curve. The curve is said to be inferior and anteriorly. Uh, much of this curve occurs at the angle. Where's the angle located? It's usually a few centimeters uh, lateral, or you could say distal, if you want it, uh, to the rib tubercle. Right, super important concept here. We're almost done. Hang in there. I guess we're not almost done. I thought there was only 60 some slides. Um, <coughs> so costal groove we talked about yesterday, uh, and we said that in the costal groove, nerve artery and vein, nave, uh, runs. Uh, so nerve, so nerve artery. I might have said this backwards. Nerve artery and vein uh, run this direction from I to S. Nerve artery and vein. If you use van, that's vein artery nerve. These are all intercostal nerve artery and vein. So why am I bringing this up? So you guys aren't medical students, so you don't have to worry. But see how the nerve hangs at the bottom of the rib? So if you have a pneumothorax, you have to learn to insert a chest tube uh, when you're a doctor or a medical doctor. And when you insert a chest tube, if you put the tube hugging the top rib, what's going to happen? And it's got a sharp little, it's like a spear almost. You spear it through the rib. You can hit that that nerve and you can cause a permanent nerve damage and chronic pain because of that. <clears throat> so you always hug the, the top of the bottom rib. You always hug the top of the ribs when you put these tubes in so you stay away from that nerve. Right? Then there's muscles here you'll learn in these next quarter. The external intercostal, the internal intercostal, and the innermost intercostal. And I won't test you on those. You'll get those next quarter. Uh, but you should definitely know the order of these nerves. And where do they go? Uh, they run in the costal groove. There's a shot I actually took this morning. Didn't have a good picture of that. But now we can see a really nice costal groove running right here on the bottom. So how would the how would the ner how would the neurovascular bundle sit there? Well, nave, nerve artery and vein. If you or you could go van from the top, but the nerve, then the artery would sit there, and then the vein would be here at the top. See how that works? Or van if you go from the top down. All right, there's just another picture of it. You can see how nice it looks. You can also see this trick next quarter. Hopefully they'll teach you this. Uh, but you can always tell the difference between the, the internal intercostal muscle and the innermost because the nerve artery and vein uh, will be between these two structures. So the innermost intercostal is deep and the internal intercostal is more superficial. All right, let's look at some atypical ribs here. Uh, so the oddball ribs are ribs number 1, 2, 10, 11, 12. So rib number 1 is clinically important because it can be involved in a compression uh, of the inferior trunk of the brachial plexus. Oh, remember that? Um, actually, let's see, that's, you're probably just getting that, uh, right? Have you got that yet? You're getting to the brachial plexus, I bet just started that so clinically important that first rib you can you can compress the brachial plexus that inferior trunk um, by a problem with the first rib so it's short it's flat I might pull it out next week just to let you look at it so important um, and yeah you can always tell what it looks like I did I not put a picture there's a picture of it right there so it's really weird looking isn't it there's its costal cartilage. It's got its own facet on the manubrium. Um, it's also got a tubercle, scaling tubercle here, where the uh, anterior scaling attaches to. And then posteriorly, 
Um, it's still got a head, it's got a neck, and it's got a tubercle. Um, but it's real short, and it's real flat, and it sits at a very horizontal plane. So, yep, it has a scaling tubercle on it. That's always an easy question. What attaches to the scaling tubercle? But there's three scalings, right? S there's anterior, middle, and posterior scaling. So it's the anterior scaling attaches to that. Uh, and then the anatomy in that area is very important uh, because the subclavian vein passes anterior to the scalene tubercle and the sc anterior scalene. But the problem is the artery, subclavian artery, and the posterior trunk of the brachial plexus pass behind it in this weird little triangle. And that's a source. Uh, it can be impinged, and people have horrible pain in their pinky and their ring finger burning all the way down that part of their arm. That's C8 dermatome uh, in people with thoracic outlet syndrome. They typically have seen tons of these people. They come in and they always say, oh, I put in can lights over the weekend, or I put in a ceiling fan, I have horrible pain in my, I couldn't sleep, I have pain burning down into my pinky and ring finger. That's a classic sign of thoracic outlet syndrome. Some people can get blood clots from that as well. And you'll, you'll study that intensely when you go through the program. But we'll look at it quickly here. So there's the scaling tubercle on the first rib. This is an A to P view. There's the anterior scaling, and very strangely, uh, the committee put the artery and the nerve between the anterior and middle scaling. Um, the, uh, the vein is spared. It's outside here, so you're probably not going to get a, um, a blood clot, a venous blood clot, but you can get an arterial blood clot that can go and get stuck in your hand somewhere or in your arm. But more, even more important than that, you can get a neuropathy. Not a radiculopathy. This is called a neuropathy when the nerve is injured and causes motor deficit away from the spine. If it's at the spine level, it's called a radiculopathy. Um, but yeah, and then if we add the clavicle over the top of that and the subclavius muscle, we got a pretty tight squeeze here. Now they didn't draw the nerve in, but I can draw the nerve in for them. The nerve would be right here, and that's the inferior or trunk of the brachial plexus, which ultimately is going to give rise to the ulnar nerve. And so, yeah, that's confusingly and stupidly, I can say, it's called thoracic outlet syndrome because the original clinicians didn't, didn't realize that this is not the thoracic outlet. This is actually called the thoracic inlet. So it should be called thoracic inlet syndrome, but they just can't get that, they can't get rid of that thoracic outlet. Um, so that's a real like like egg in the face of anatomists and clinicians to call it that. Drives me crazy, but what can you do? You can't do anything about it. Anyway, you'll get to that when the time comes. Uh, the first rib articulates only with the T1 vertebrae uh, and only with the manubrium, we could say as well. Uh, there's a full costal facet on T1 for it. Occasionally, uh, you can have a demi facet and a demi facet on C7. Usually, you don't. C7 usually doesn't have a demi facet for ribs, but once in a blue moon. But for the most part, for a board question, it has its full s facet uh, uh, and not a demi facet superiorly on the lateral body of T1. The second rib is more like a normal rib. It has a more vertical uh, orientation, runs more vertically. Um, it also has a tubercle, unlike other ribs, and this is what makes it atypical. Uh, it has a, a tubercle on it. Um, they call it a tuberosity sometimes as well, um, but, um, but that's where serratus anterior muscle digs into, and it creates a real rough surface on the second rib. The tenth rib, uh, its head has only one facet on it, so there's no uh, there's no crest. So that's kind of weird about a rib. We've talked about how they have crests, um, and it usually articulates with T10. Has only one full costal facet as well. It usually doesn't share with T9. Occasionally, just like with T1, occasionally there c it can share uh, the connection with T9, but it usually doesn't. Uh, T11 and 12 
these are the floating ribs, right, or a.k.a. false ribs, a.k.a. free ribs. They don't connect to the, the uh, sternum in any way. That's an easy softball question you can't miss. Um, they only connect with their respective vertebrae through a full costal facet. Right, the uh, costal, kind of said these, costal vertebral articulations. Um, so each posterior rib has a, uh, each posterior rib of a typical vertebrae articulates with two vertebral bodies through the demi facets and one transverse process. What type of joints are those? Those are real joints. Those are diarthroidal joints, just like your knee is a diarthroidal joint. Uh, your elbow, your shoulder, those are diarthroidal joints. What does that mean? They have a joint capsule around them. They have a synovial membrane covering the inside, which secretes synovial fluid. And so they're filled with a slippery fluid. Those are diarthroidal joints. And they also have nociceptive fiber. So they're capable of becoming horrible sources of pain should things go wrong. Uh, the joints between the vertebral bodies and the ribs are called the costal vertebral joints. You'll be adjusting these things. Um, uh, all the time. Okay, um, they're also called an AKA for that is costal corporal, uh, costal vertebral and costal corporal are AKAs. So, oh, I see what I'm saying here. The costal vertebral joints—that's a general word. When you say costal vertebral joint, uh, you're talking about both the connection to the vertebral bodies and the connection to the transverse processes. So there's two types of costal vertebral joints. There's a costal corporal joint. That one's the one that's sometimes called the costal vertebral joint, but it really shouldn't be um, because costal vertebral is the main category. And uh, the one that connects to the costal demi facets, uh, that's the costal corporal. Remember, corporal means body. So costal corporal articulations and costal transverse. Let's take a look at them. Costal corporal, a.k.a. terrible, a.k.a. is costal vertebral joints. Um, it's articulation between the rib head, the facets of the rib head, and the costal demi facets of the body. So there's actually four of those. And we studied these in lab, so you're starting to get the hang of these. So superior costal demi facet, inferior costal demi facet, number seven. Number five is a costal transverse facet. So just these two, the demi facets here, um, those are costal corporal, form cor costal corporal joints. All right, we don't need to go over the anatomy again. Um, and yeah, the two, two, two diarthroidal joints, all the costal vertebral joints are true diarthroidal joints. They're a little weird though. They have a smaller than no normal synovial fold. Uh, that protrudes out, so it's not going to get pinched like it could in the cervical or lumbar spine. Um, like the, I'm talking about the Z joint in those regions also have a synovial fold. Um, it has free nerve endings, so it can be definitely can be a source of pain. It can get pinched, uh, very similar to a little Z joint, really, or a little uh, facet joint. Right here's a nice view, an overhead view. So this is the costal corporal joint right here. It's hard to tell if this is the. It's probably the. I would say it's probably the superior costal demi facet here. Matches the what? Inferior facet of the rib head. And then there's just the costal transverse joint would be right there. We can also see a nice view of the costal transverse ligament. There's the lateral costal transverse ligament there. Okay, costal transverse articulation made by the facet of the costal tubercle and the transverse costal facet. You don't see these at T11 or T12. Um, sometimes T10 doesn't have it either, but you never see. It's an easy question there. Where don't you see the costal transverse articulations? Well, on the floating ribs, T11 and T12. Uh, these are true diarthroidal joints, and we are done. Good luck with Dr. Doe and his quiz. 
All right, I'll come back to answer questions. You can take off if you don't have any questions. Yep. And I was not meaning to do that. So the, but I got it right here. So this one can go on uh, YouTube. Somebody send me an email to remind me if you guys are interested in watching these things again. I can put it up on YouTube. 